It's a real pleasure for me to have the honor of introducing our speaker tonight because I admire him so greatly, and I'm just one of many who feel that way. Brother Earl Edwards has been a tower of strength in the Brotherhood of Christ for many, many years, and uh, we're just so grateful to him for accepting the invitation that we extended to come and preach here tonight on the subject of the church which Paul loved. And of course, all of us know that we speak of the Lord's church, and there's no doubt in my mind that Brother Edwards will do a masterful job in presenting in this lesson and stirring our hearts with these great truths. He was educated at David Lipscomb College and Harding Graduate School and Trinity Evangelical, I'll get it in a minute, Divinity School, where he received a doctoral degree in 1960. He served as a missionary in the country of Italy for some 16 years and was director of the Florence Bible School while he was over there. He has taught in the Bible department at Harding University and then served as director of mission studies and dean of the School of Biblical Studies and director of the graduate studies in Bible at Fried Hardeman University, where he is now an adjunct professor. Since 1977, he has served as one of the evangelists of the Finger Tennessee Church of Christ and since April 1999 as one of its elders. In addition, Earl preaches in about 20 gospel meetings and seminars and lectureships each year all over the United States and in numerous foreign countries. So you can see at a glance that he is immensely qualified and there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to hear a very wonderful lesson. Earl, we're honored to have you. Thank you, Brother Maxie, and it is a joy to be with you this evening. I really appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate this good church and what it's meant to the brotherhood and the school that is with this church and under this church. I wish to encourage both works in every way possible. I appreciate the elders of this good church and Brother Maxie and the invitation to be here this evening. If it were possible for Paul to visit in the United States of America today, and let's just say, for example, that he went into some place quite distant from us. Let's say some place like uh, Montana. And he found a church there that he would write later and just really commend numerous aspects of the work of that particular church. I believe I'd probably want to make a trip up there. Stay there, Brother Maxie, for a week or so and study what that church was doing to observe what would cause the Apostle Paul to commend them in that way. Well, I think the Philippian church is that kind of a church. It's the church that Paul dearly loved. Chrysostom, who was a church father, said that it gave Paul no excuse for anything that was against it, that, that any problem with the church at all. Well, I think he exaggerated a little bit. In chapter 4 and verse 2, chapter 3, verses 2, you do find some possible problems at Philippi, but very few, few of those. In fact, the epistle's major purpose seems to be the expression of joy and encouragement to the Philippians to rejoice. The word joy in its verbal form is found in the epistle at least 15 times in the four chapters. The commentator Fee would not agree with me on the epistle's major purpose, but at least he admits this. In contrast to many of Paul's other letters, especially the more polemical and or apologetic letters such as Galatians and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Philippians reflects all of the characteristics of a letter of friendship combined with those of a letter of moral exhortation. I think he is right. Our brother Roper in writing about it has said the church at Philippi was special to Paul. In this letter, Paul was not the cool logician, the profound theologian, or the impassioned defender of truth. Rather, he was a man writing from his heart to his friends. I like that. Our brother Avon Malone, who used to teach in the school here, said it this way. He said, Philippi, the Philippian church, was, was Paul's sweetheart church. I think it's fair to say the Philippian church came the closest to being the type of church that Paul the Apostle and the Holy Spirit dearly loved and is as close to a model of what the Holy Spirit wants in a church as we can find in the New Testament. And that church is described pretty well in the first 11 verses of chapter 1, and I want you to turn there now. 
And we're going to look at several things that we see about that church to see if we can emulate those in our own congregation. In the first place, number one, the church that Paul loved had a specific composition or organization. Look at verse 1, where the epistle is addressed to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. Saints is from a particular Greek word. It is defined by Bauer Arndt Gingrich as Christians as purified and consecrated to God. When you say saints, the emphasis is on being purified, being made holy, being sanctified. It refers to all baptized believers there at Philippi. In fact, it does not refer to saints in the Roman Catholic sense of people who supposedly have died and then uh, have done certain miracles, supposedly. Saint, of course, is related to the verb sanctify. The action is to sanctify, and the noun then of the person that's been sanctified describes him as one who is a saint, one who is holy. So first of all, it was made up of saints. Secondly, in its organization, there were overseers. There is a particular Greek term that is used there. The King James renders it bishops. Bauer's definition of the term that's used there is this, persons who have a definite function or fixed office of guardianship within a group, including a religious group. Several years ago, I was involved in the program One Nation Under God that began in, with some of our brethren in Cookville, Tennessee. And I went to Cookville and Brother Horace Burks who was the deacon who had a lot to do with organizing that, uh, had a furniture factory. And we met in his office. His office was up on the second floor, and then there was a, uh, probably a, a factory about as wide as this auditorium, maybe a little wider, and he looked out over, supervised all of those workers, about 100 of them in the furniture factory. Elders are overseers. They are responsible for overlooking and guiding the work in a particular congregation. Paul gives the qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. They are to be exemplary family men with children that believe, Titus 1 and verse 6. They are to be able to teach adults and to refute false teachers, 1 Timothy 3, 2 and Titus 1, 9. They are not to lord it over the members, 1 Peter 5 and verse 3, but they are to, the New American Standard uses this term, they are to rule or direct their congregations, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17. Now from the evidence, it seems that the congregational members used the qualifications that we have in the passages already mentioned, and they would nominate the candidates, the candidates from among them for elder or deacon, and then an apostle or an evangelist would install them in the office. That's the pattern we have in Acts 14.23. There was always a plurality of elders in every congregation, Acts 14.23 in our passage here. Possibly the Holy Spirit required this to avoid church dictators. So there were overseers in the church at Philippi. Likewise, he addresses the letter to deacons. Bauer defines deacon as attendant, assistant, aide. These were selected in the same way as the elders were. And they were selected according to the qualifications given in 1 Timothy 3. Yes, they could be younger. They didn't have to have believing children. They're not required to be apt to teach. Basically, they are assistants to the elders. The elders are to delegate them work and then hold them accountable for that work. In the congregation there at Philippi, no evangelist is mentioned at the time Paul writes the letter. However, I know there had been some evangelists in that congregation earlier. Paul had been one of them and others along with him. In fact, Paul told Timothy when he was at Ephesus, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 3, to do the work of an evangelist, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5. Timothy was working with Paul when he founded the church there at Philippi, according to the book of Acts, chapter 16. And the evangelist's work was to preach the word, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. He is never said to rule, by the way, in the congregation. He, too, works under the elders. Now, this is the composition or organization of the church that Paul loved. What is the composition or organization of churches today, by the way? What about mine? What about yours? You know, some would say, if you want to really have a church that flies, it doesn't really make any difference. These are trivialities. They say it's okay to use saint differently, like the Roman Catholics do. Some of them say it's okay to have one bishop over 50 congregations. 
It's okay to run the church even without elders. Even some of our fairly good brethren have said that in my presence not too long ago. I was asking a brother, I said, I know in your congregation you have some people who are qualified to be elders. Why haven't you put them in? And he said, well, they say if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I said, Paul says it's broke. There is something lacking, Titus 1 and verse 5. And the model that you have here at Philippi and elsewhere is elders and deacons. In fact, listen to Paul in the same letter, Philippians 4 at verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. How did Paul organize churches? How did Paul want the church to be composed? Paul says, do it like I did it. Do it like you see me doing it because I'm guided by the Holy Spirit and then God will be with you. And if you don't, what's the implication? God will not be with you. But in the second place, as you look at that church, the kind of church that Paul loved, please notice on the screen, it caused its leaders to rejoice at the very thought of it. Listen to verses 3 through 5. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Then Paul speaks of their love, which he prays will abound still more. Look down in verse 9. We've already said that one of the predominant themes of the epistle is joy. Philippians is a hymn of joy, and that term appears many times. As an evangelist, I've been involved over the years with quite a number of local churches in over 60 years of ministry. Some were not that great, but I do remember one even today. I was there for five years. I've been away from it for well over 30 years. It is still special in my memory. It's the Bridges Street Church of Christ in Wynn, Arkansas. A nice progressive town in Arkansas, the delta of Arkansas with about 8,000 population, good church facilities, strong aggressive eldership, a good benevolent program. We had a wee care shop where we took care of benevolence for, for various people. We had a good Bible school. We had five buses running to pick up people to bring them in. And I was able to help them develop a good personal work program. At one time, we had 10 teams going out teaching at, one, at least one time each week, non-members in the community. And on one, in one particular year, we baptized 36 people, 29 of those that had nothing to do with the church before that time. We also extended our missions work into Minnesota and Nigeria and Italy and other places. At the end of five years that I was there, we were giving 40% of our budget to missions. Indeed, I thank my God for every remembrance of that congregation. I think I feel a little like Paul felt when he thought about the Philippians. But what were the specific positive characteristics of the Philippian church that caused them to be a church that Paul remembered and had good memories of? Number one, look at verse 9. We've mentioned it a moment ago, but their love. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. It's clear they already possessed some love, but Paul wants them to increase it. What's he talking about? The term that he uses means the quality of warm regard for and interest in another, esteem, affection, definition by Bauer, Arndt, and Gingrich. That must have included, for example, if they had widows in their congregation, they were interested in them, they took care of them. It certainly included looking around and trying to reach their pagan neighbors. It involves, notice please, not just living yourself and all closed up inside, it, in, it involves interest in others. No wonder then the second characteristic beyond love is, look at it in verse 5, their participation, the term is koinonia in Greek, participation in the gospel. The term that's used there means a close association involving mutual interest and sharing. In other words, after Paul founded the Philippian church and left there, they helped him financially. financially. They helped him, we know, while he was at Thessalonica more than once, chapter 4 and verse 16. And very probably they were among the Macedonians who helped him while he was down at Corinth. Some Macedonians did, according to 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 9. And now at Rome, he, required, he received a gift from them also. When he writes the Philippian letter, he's at Rome in prison there. And he receives another gift from them, chapter 4 and verse 18. Listen carefully. For the Philippians preaching to others 
was not just God's business and Paul's business. It was their business. They participated in it. It was their responsibility. They shared that responsibility. No wonder Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. And that not just once, but always. Philippians 1 verses 3 and 4. Indeed, this congregation was one which caused her founder and her leaders to rejoice, to experience joy. What about my congregation and yours? Could the founders of my congregation, could the founders of the congregation you're a part of look back and find joy because we are now serving in those congregations? Are we supporting preachers nearby like the Philippian church was at Thessalonica, it was nearby? Are we involved in personal work, reaching out? By the way, how many of us take one night a week and try to see if we can reach out to people and go and hold studies in the homes of others? Surely there are many of us who are capable of doing that. Are we doing it? Are we supporting preaching far away like they were when they sent money to Rome when Paul was there? Some churches of Christ don't give a whole lot. I've tried to figure over our brotherhood about what we're giving average. As best I can tell, my brethren, we are probably not giving more than about a 4% of our gross income average. I've figured up 150 or more congregations among us. And many times, not very much of our budget is going toward outreach. But there have been in our times, too, some good churches. I remember one in Nashville in the 1970s that was giving over 50% of its rather large budget to outreach. We must do more to reach out that we may be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A fellow by the name of Davis wrote this, Lord, give me a passion for the lost, for souls so deep in sin, that I may lead them to the cross, that one you died to win. Give me a burden for that heart bowed down in deep despair. Then come, dear Lord, and heal the wound that, that sin has planted there. Lord, lay someone upon my heart. God, give me the grace to go and tell them of thy saving power and how you love them so. Indeed, number two, the Philippian church caused its founders like Paul to rejoice at every thought of that congregation, principally because it loved and accepted the responsibility of reaching out. But I think we should ask ourselves where they learned that kind of love. Where did they learn that kind of involvement, those Philippian brethren? Third, the third point we want to notice is this about that congregation. The kind of church that Paul loved had leaders with warm feelings for the members. Notice their first leader, Paul, though he is now far away, he had from the very beginning devoted himself when he went there and founded that church. In chapter 1 and verse 1 again, he describes himself as a bond servant of the church. Oh, he felt some responsibility toward that church. Undoubtedly, he preached and taught and begged both day and night there at Philippi, just as he said he did at Ephesus over in Acts 20 and verse 31. He dedicated himself to reaching out because of love. And note his feelings as he writes back to the Philippian congregation. Are you looking at verses 7 and 8 of the text, please? For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul's relationship with the Philippian church was not just an academic one. It involved feelings. I feel a certain way about you, verse 7. Also, verse 7, I have you in my heart. One student has said this. He said the high priest in the Old Testament wore a special garment, the, the ephod, over his heart. On it were twelve stones with the names of the twelve tribes of Israel engraved on them, a jewel for each tribe, Exodus 28. He carried the people over his heart in love, and so did Paul carry the Philippians over his heart. Listen to Paul again. I long for you, verse 8. I long for you with the affection of Christ. To long for means I crave for you. I ardently desire to have contact with you. And it is I long for you with the affection of Christ, with the same kind of affection that Jesus Christ had. Remember, Paul says, imitate me as I also imitate Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. 
When I think of the feelings of Jesus Christ and the affection of Christ, I think of a term that's used fairly frequently in Scripture to describe Jesus and how he felt about people. In fact, in the King James, it talks about bowels, the internal organs. Remember Christ looking at Jerusalem. And he said in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but you would not. And then Luke, the 19th chapter, in verse 41, he saw the, the city and wept over it. Paul's love for the Philippians was like that love. In fact, he even goes on to say, God is my witness that this is true. The first part of verse 8. We will not go far astray in saying that the Philippian church was a good church partly because of the love, because of the warm feelings of Paul and probably his co-workers, that warm feeling that the Philippians had learned from him. And what about the congregations where some of us are leaders today? Are there such warm feelings evident? In fact, do we, thank you. In fact, do we trust, do we just teach and preach the academic part and show little feeling? Do we kind of hold them, the members at arm's length maybe? Or do we feel with them really? Do we have strong affection? Are we there in sickness to hold their hands? Are we beside them in death and embrace them? Are we with them when their children mess up and they're deep in tears? Shouldn't we remember that number three, to be a strong church, a congregation needs loving, caring leaders to lead it and to show the way. That's one of the things about the church that Paul loved, the Philippian church. But a fourth thing about that Philippian church that Paul loved, it had leaders who prayed for the members. Will you listen in with me on the prayer of, this, or the, of their first leader, the Apostle Paul? Can't you see him maybe on his knees as he utters, beginning with verse 9? And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The prayer of that leader, Paul, was that they do their part. Look at verse 9. That they have more love. The term is agape love. We've noticed they already had some, but he wants them to develop even more love. And secondly, he prays in verse 9 that they have more knowledge. That's an interesting term, epigenose in Greek. It's not just knowledge. Thayer defines it this way, precise and correct knowledge. In fact, some translations say full knowledge. A deep understanding of how things really are. Oh, we need that today, don't we? So he prays that they have more knowledge, full knowledge. And number three, he prays, verse 9, that they might be able to discern so as to abound in insight, Bauer says in verse, on page 29. It has to do with perception of the inner nature of things, of any matter. It's kind of like this when you're talking about discerning. You remember the term when you used to think about the Old West and the assayer of metals, A-S-S-A-Y-E-R? He had to discern between real gold and fool's gold, remember? It might look like it, but it isn't. He had to discern. Paul is praying that these Christians will grow mature, that they will know how to discern. How will that help them or how would it help us today? But well, in the first place, it will help us to discern true from false doctrine. Somebody comes along and says, oh, don't worry about all of these things, all of these commandments. You know, God is a loving God. He's going to save everybody. I need to be a discerner then when people say that. Or it'll help us to discern, and maybe this has to do with even more of us, between good things and excellent things. Notice there in verse 10, he mentions good things and excellent things. By the way, it's good to support the little, little, little League Baseball. But it is excellent to attend services of the Lord's body. And excellent is more important than good. Excellent is imperative and you need to learn to discern between the two. I've sometimes illustrated it this way. 
I've lived in neighborhoods where I wish my neighbors would learn to mow their lawns. <clears throat> Maybe there are a few of them that didn't, uh, didn't mow their lawns and made the whole neighborhood look bad. So it is good to mow your lawn, isn't it? But let's say one day I'm thinking of one particular situation I lived in when my son was a teenager, and let's say I have been out mowing the lawn, about finished it. My wife comes running out and says, Terry just fell, Terry, my son, just fell, and he hit his head, and he's bleeding badly. We need to rush him to the hospital. Suppose I say to her, now look, good neighbors need to mow their lawn. And I'm mowing lawn, I'm doing something good, don't bother me. You see, sometimes it becomes a sin to put something good over something that is imperative. And Paul prayed that those Philippians would be able to discern between such things. And number four, he prays, verse 10, that they might be blameless until the day of Christ. The day of Christ obviously refers to his return to judge the world. He will be the judge of the world. The Father has given all judgment into his hands, John 5 and verse 22. It's the same idea that you have in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13. There he says, So that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord. He wants those Philippians to stand purified at the coming of the Lord, blameless at his coming. That is, cleansed of sin, that implies repentance from any sin, so as to be saved in heaven finally. And then number five, he prays in verse 11, that they be on that day found filled with the fruit of righteousness. My, that is a graphic expression. One place where I lived, in fact, it was again in Wynn, Arkansas, and in my backyard we had a plum tree. It was probably about 25 feet high, a lot of branches, and that plum tree literally bore so much fruit that it would break its own limbs. It got so heavy it would break some of its own limbs off. That's the way Paul wants the Philippians and us to be. Didn't Jesus say in John 15 and verse 16, I chose you and I want you to bear fruit? One of the purposes we have. And if we don't, we'll be like branches that will be cut off and cast into the fire, John 15 and verse 16. We have been created through His grace. We've been made Christians and we've been created unto good works which the Father purposed that we be involved in, Ephesians 2 and verse 10. If we are to be blameless then when He comes at the judgment, we must bear fruit now. My, what a beautiful prayer Paul prays for that Philippian church. What prayers do we as leaders pray for our congregation? What do we do especially in elders' meetings, elders? I also am an elder at the Finger Congregation. And what do we preachers do? Do we talk most of the time about new auditoriums or renovating the auditorium or new buildings or parking lots or whatever else, or do we pray about people? Yes, I know those other things have some importance, but not primary importance. We should pray for people. Teachers should pray for class members, young la ladies, and older ladies that teach ladies and children, do you pray for your class members? Do you visit those who don't attend? Deacons, do you pray for those who are on your work team? Elders, do we pray for negligent members that need restoring? By the way, some time ago we started in the congregation where I am. In an elders meeting we take the directory and we pray and we go down through and we'll take maybe seven or eight or ten members each elders meeting and pray for those specifically. And each elder will tell what he knows about the particular person and we will pray for those members. That they might have more love. That they might have more discernment. That they might be found blameless in the day of the Lord when the Lord comes again. God help us to pray for others and if we do, unless we're hypocritical, We'll, be do more, be, we'll do more visiting. We'll be out beating the bushes more. Plus, prayer will help. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And by the way, maybe I'm talking tonight to some people here in this assembly who are not leaders in any sense, but you have the ability, and you could develop that ability. 
By this time you ought to be teachers, the Hebrews writer would say in Hebrews 5 and verse 12. God help us all when we pray to imitate Paul as he imitated Christ, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. And yes, number four, the church Paul loved also had leaders who prayed earnestly for its members. Another reason why it was a very good church. In conclusion, would Paul be pleased if he visited my congregation next Sunday, or what about yours? Would he find it composed and organized like his? Or maybe would he find some women deaconesses in it? Would he find it causing its leaders and founders to rejoice? Or maybe would it be causing the founders, as they look back on it, to be sorrowful and wonder why it's not sharing the gospel? Would he find its leaders having warm feelings for the members? Or maybe a cold, not non-caring academic attitude where we just kind of teach and leave it to them and don't really care and hold them at arm's length? Or would he find it has leaders who pray earnestly for its members, number four? Or maybe leaders who are more concerned about the budget and other such things? God help us to meditate on important things and especially on being a congregation like Paul loved and a leader like Paul was. Listen to Paul in the same letter before we close. Philippians 4 verses 8 and following. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then once again that verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. May it be so in all of our congregations. Amen.